Hello everybody, my name is James and I am an autoholic. There, I've said it. I can't help myself, I just love cars. And before you start mocking, you're all complicit in this too, because for the last six years you've been enabling me, you lovely, wonderful people, allowing me to lead this rather majestic life and share it with you all. I am lucky enough to call myself a custodian of three Ferraris. I would say owner, but then the Piston Heads crowd would get a little bit upset. Technically speaking, I am the owner of one Ferrari and the leaseholder of two others. In the last video update on my Ferrari 550 Maranello, affectionately known as Judas, I told you all how I just spent another five-figure sum for the privilege of not seeing the car for nine months. Now, many of you were quick to comment, and most of you were very supportive, because it turns out you are equally as infatuated with your pride and joy as I am with mine. But there were also a bunch of you telling me that this is exactly the sort of reason why you steer clear of anything exotic, instead remaining with something sensible, like a Toyota, because those will never cost you a penny to run beyond what they should. Au contraire, Blackadder, stepping up to the plate and fighting for the honour of the Japanese automobile industry is this, my lesser spotted 1996 Toyota Celica GT4, a car that I've owned now for about three and a half years, but in that time barely seen, however it is now, at long last, finally, back home, on the driveway, working and in a condition I can be proud of. But how much has it cost me to get there? Has it really been as expensive or more so than a classic Ferrari? Well, find out after these important messages. Remember everyone, in order to stop yourself doing a JM and buying a lemon, make sure to use Car Vertical, the super-powered super search that cross-references a number of databases across the globe to give you all the information you want to know about any potential used car purchase, including mileage issues, accident damage regardless of whether a car has been written off or not, outstanding finance and if a vehicle has been stolen. They'll even give you some handy hints and tips on popular models and key things to look out for. For a car vertical search, you just need a reg number or VIN, and the service is now available both on desktop and mobile too. It costs about the same as a sack of potatoes, and at this point in time, I am running out of things to compare the price with. In any case, for a special discount or whatever the price is, check out my link in the description down below. A potted history of myself and this car. How long have I had it for? Well, I bought this to celebrate 25,000 subscribers, so about three and a half years ago. And the Celica GT4, yes, that is what we call it here in Britain, the Celica, nobody calls it a Celica, regardless of whether that may actually be correct or not. This car has always represented to me the excessively desirable. This is a car I've always wanted, but also always thought I could afford, because for a long time, the prices were exceptionally reasonable. About 10 years ago, you could pick up a good example for just a few thousand pounds. Today, they do command a little bit more, but nowhere near as much as their contemporaries. Reasons I absolutely love this car include the fact it is a genuine rally homologation special, a star of Sega Rally, and a car to wear that iconic Castrol livery. I also think this is one of Japan's prettiest cars and maybe the best looking rally car not to wear a Lancia badge. Just look at it. Okay, this one sits slightly lower, courtesy of some teen springs, but the shape is perfect. So smooth, sleek and purposeful, particularly with the full-size rear spoiler. And this bonnet at the front, that has to be the coolest bonnet in history. Just being sat there, seeing the little details is so, so cool. I love this car and, though I have a general aversion to anything in white, for me this is the colour. Being a rally car, I also think it looks just as good dirty as it does clean, and that is the excuse that I'm sticking with. I'd always wanted one of these cars, always been checking the classifieds back when three or four thousand pounds for a car was far more than I could possibly afford. And then, a few years ago, courtesy of a good friend, I managed to drive one and found that it went just as well as I had imagined. In fact, it was even better. The steering, brilliant. The engine, old school turbocharged and exciting. And the whole thing just came together and really did not assist with my lusting for one a single bit. It even has semi-usable back seats and a fairly generously sized boot too, which is very important to me. At the time, I was going to need to use this as a daily driver if I were to justify the expense. 
And it is probably because I was so smitten with the car that I did make a few schoolboy errors in purchasing this. I was so desperate to get my hands on one, so fearful that the prices were going to rise quicker than I could save, that the moment I found a white example in what looked like good condition, I knew that I had to have it. The advert certainly seemed to be saying all the right things. There were photographs of the underside where it had allegedly been religiously maintained and protected against the elements, vital for any old Japanese car. There was also a list of work undertaken by the current and previous owner, including many of the common failure points, the banana arms, various service items. It came with a USB stick detailing things like the full glass out respray that it had allegedly had and other items too. It sounded like a very good car. The owner also seemed like an enthusiast, which is very important. So we agreed a price, I paid a deposit and I went down to go and see the car. Immediately, a few things became obvious. There was some damage to the front, which wasn't evident in pictures. Neither was the cracking paintwork at the back. We went out for a test drive, and because I didn't have the insurance policy then that I do now, I couldn't drive it. So I did it from the passenger seat. And the car seemed absolutely fine. I decided that, okay, there were a few things I had to tend to I didn't expect, but I could see them. I knew what the cost of paint was. I reckoned I could deal with it. The overall picture was a positive one. So I paid the money and left. Almost immediately, I realized things were not right. The gearbox was graunching into third every time, unless you were incredibly delicate and slow with it. I messaged the owner as soon as I got back and was told I just needed to learn how to drive it. No, I didn't. That is a synchro on the way out. A few days later, I got home to notice smoke coming from the front. I popped the bonnet and saw that a small pool of oil had gathered on top of one of the ridges of the engine and gearbox casing. Again, I messaged the seller and said, what's going on here? His reply was, well, mate, <laughs> that's why they call them the GT Faf. The car had come with a box of odds and sods. In there was the original air box, a decap pipe, but also, more interestingly, some bushings for the gearbox and a gasket for the exact piece that was leaking the oil. Hmm. I think it would be unfair to say that the previous owner neglected the car. There were certainly plenty of invoices showing that he'd spent on it and the stuff he'd bought was all good quality. However, he did not help his case by selling it with what I found out were four year old photos and his general attitude towards the car after the sale really did disappoint. I tried to do the best that I could with the resources that I had. So the wheels were refurbished, the tires replaced and that did really lift the whole thing. I continued driving it, but it just wasn't right. Other things started bugging me too. There was an unusual noise coming from the engine bay on occasion, which turned out to be the charge cooler pump on its way out. This was worrying because the reason the car was on its second engine was due to a charge cooler pump failure, and I had no interest in paying for engine number three. The tires were also absolutely lethal in the wet. They were Yokohama Parada Spec 2s, which I'd never heard of and haven't seen since. Apparently, they're very popular in the Californian tuning scene because they look like good tires and they're pretty decent in the dry, but terrible in the wet, which Californians don't have to worry about, but we do. The wheels were also in need of refurbishment and somewhat let the entire car down, irrespective of the condition of the rest of it. And I became a little bit suspicious of that paint job. The advertisement had clearly said the car had received a full glass out respray. Now, helpfully on the USB stick that came with it were pictures of said respray and a big document from the previous owner, in which he said that the plan was to have a full glass out respray. However, while they were preparing for it, they found some corrosion and the paint shop was limited on time. So they made the, I guess, sensible compromise to deal with the corrosion, but skimp on some areas of the respray. So the glass did not come out and that's why there was some overspray on some of the seals. More than that though, six years down the line, you could tell whether the paint was original or not. This was three or four different shades of white. And then to add insult to injury, the car started running rough and doing a very fine Hannibal Lecter impression. This being an old school boosty turbocharged car, it should sound like this under power. But instead, it started sounding like this. Not good and clearly not making full power either. I'll be honest, I was heartbroken. My dream car, 
didn't look good, didn't drive good. I was humiliated. Every time I saw this on the driveway, which was every day, it did depress me just a little. And remember, this is a long time ago. I did not have the resources that I'm lucky enough to have now. I wanted to fix this car. I wanted to get it running and right, but I had to try and do so on a budget. And that required a little bit of creative thinking. I put out a call asking if anybody out there knew somebody that could do a bit of restoration and wasn't hellishly expensive. A very friendly chap called Ashley got in touch, who was, by his own admission, a hobbyist. However, that meant that he was reasonably priced. So we did a deal and he agreed to take the car away and tend to some of the more pressing issues. This wasn't going to be a complete refurbishment, but hopefully enough to get me to the stage where I could once again enjoy the car. He took it away in winter time and we'd always planned that it would would take a good few months so I could save up the money necessary to pay for the work. Unfortunately, COVID then struck and pushed things back considerably. This in some ways was quite a good thing for me because I thought, right, I've bought myself a few more months to try and save a little bit more money and do an even better job. Fast forward almost a year after the car had been collected and we hit a snag. Though some of the mechanical work had been tended to, Ashley's paint shop let them down. So I had to find an alternative. Once again, I came to all of you and somebody got in touch offering the services of a firm they'd begun to work with. The car was taken over to their facilities at Telford and I was quoted for a full and complete respray, the job the car was advertised as having had. Now, yes, I did get a bit of YouTuber discount, but I still paid a fairly healthy price. In fact, I believe the total sum was about £3,800. By the time the car came back to me, I was about two years into the ownership experience. And though, yes, I did have a couple of issues with the paintwork, overall, it was a massive improvement on what it was before. And once again, I fell in love with the car. I began driving it. And for about five minutes, I remembered why I was so smitten with this thing. It drove so well, steered so nicely, was so fun and engaging. And then I remembered why I had fallen out of love with it. It started running rough again and more worryingly under power, it was now smoking too. Something I hadn't noticed previously, but saw very clearly in my rear view mirror and on some of the video drive-bys that we did at the time. This was not a complete surprise. After all, the mechanical work that Ashley had done was really limited to servicing the car, replacing a few pipes that I had hoped might have been the cause of my issues and also a new charge cooler pump. That at least did fix a problem, but still, the car wasn't driving right, the gearbox still wasn't good, and I suspected the turbo was on its way out and potentially the cause of the smoking. So I thought, right, this car needs sorting properly. And luckily, by this point in time, things had changed for me. The channel had grown, so I now had the resources to know that I could tackle this car comfortably. So once again, off it went, this time to MK Autos, where I had always intended it to go for the big jobs, namely the gearbox and now the turbo. They are very well-known specialists, particularly for the Gen 5 and 6 Celica. This is a Gen 6, easily identifiable by the four round headlights. The final was the Gen 7, which is the much squarer, sharper, and more angular version that never got a GT4 derivative. The most hot one there being the 190 horsepower VVTL iCar. The Gen 5 Celica has the pop-up headlights and is often referred to by people as the Carlos Sainz, though that was a specific model. This, by the way, yes, is the one that's very famous for having been caught cheating. Not that that really affects the road cars in any way. So the car went off to MK with a nice long list of things to do. And there it sat for about a month awaiting a full inspection. I was pretty nervous awaiting that phone call, I have to say. At that point, I was more or less hoping that the turbo was shot because if it wasn't, the cause of that smoking could have been the engine. And that was gonna be a lot more money. Eventually, the phone rang and I answered it. Quickly, I learned that Italian cars really are quite expensive because Martin said to me, oh yeah, we found some bits, the, uh, the big one, yeah, the real big one, that's the suspension arms. Oh, oh okay. How much are they? Uh, 300 pound. Oh, well, how many are there? Two. That's the big bit, is it? Yeah, that's, that's the big bit. Oh, okay. Um, Turbo, yeah, the, the turbo shot. Well, how much is that? That's about a grand. Oh, that's, 
that's pretty good. Um, gearbox, yeah, that needs doing. It's about the same, give or take. Oh, um, that's that's pretty good. So um, I gave him the green light and he got to work pretty quickly, I must say. He whipped out the entire drivetrain at the front end of the car, engine, gearbox, diff the lot, and got started. The original plan had always been for this car to have two visits to MK, the first being for fixes, getting it simply working, and then the next one to be for improvements. This being a Japanese car, modifications are to me a part of the ethos, and though I never wanted to go crazy with this car, there were certainly a few things that I wanted to do. Owing to my impatience and the fact that we were stripping the whole car apart anyway, I said, would it be economically advisable to do some of these upgrades at the same time? And naturally, he said yes. So we got started with the fixes. A new turbo went in and a new gearbox. He carries rebuilt items in stock to save time. A whole bunch of clamps, hoses, gaskets and the like were all sorted and done. Some of them had already begun to perish. The hose from hell was replaced, which is a cheeky little number buried right down in the works, sort of between the turbo and the engine. We also did a distributor cap, drive shaft seals, drop links, put the front fogs on, which were missing and had really been bugging me, a new clutch too, an XED three plate item that cost all of £140. The last one wasn't dead, but neither was it particularly fresh, so that seemed wise. The first invoice from MK, about £4,000 which is quite a lot of money, but if you were to look at the same amount of work, not just on a Ferrari, but even a BMW or a Porsche, that was exceptionally good value. For round two, we looked a little bit more towards future proofing. Like I said, I want to modify the car. I don't want to do anything dramatic, but with these, if you want to do anything at all, you really do need an aftermarket ECU because the factory one more or less can't be touched. So a top of the line Link G4 ECU was sourced, installed and set up. A few repairs that had passed us by on the first round were also done. A new radiator was supplied and the car was set up. That was another bill for just over £4,000. Next up on my hit list was the exhaust, for a couple of reasons. I'd had a decap pipe fitted by Ashley more or less as a fault-finding exercise. I regret it almost immediately. To say nothing of the fact that decats are illegal and their performance gains often somewhat imaginary versus a good sports cat, it sounded horrible. It droned and made all sorts of nasty noises. So I wanted to get it off as soon as possible. While it was over at MK, I said, shall I buy a sports cat? And they said, well, we can just make one for you and fit it a little bit further downstream to try and help with heat management. So they did that. The other bit about the exhaust that's annoying me is the fact that it has the typical JDM cannon fitted, which has already scorched some of my lovely new paintwork. Frustrating that, particularly as if you look at it, you'll see that the exit of the exhaust isn't that big. They've just made it that big, so it looks girthier? I don't know. In any case, MK said, look, we'll fab a new front section with a cat in it, and you can supply a back box off the shelf with whatever it is that you want. I went to Talk GT, and we have ordered a Fujitsubo Legalis R system for the car, which should mean it still sounds decent, but isn't too raucous. It's already a lot better with the sports cat fitted, and hopefully that will be the perfect combination. These things between them cost another £2,300. Are we there yet, kids? Well, nearly. At long last, a date for collection was set, and it was going to be a big one. Not only was I picking this car up, I also needed to go through the map with Martin to make sure that he and I were happy, and at the same time, I was also collecting my brand new custom computer, which many of you may have seen if you watched any of my recent office-based talking head videos. There will be a separate piece on that in the near future. In any case, the very last round of work was again more future-proofing. We installed an upgraded fuel pump, fixed a few fuel tank related issues and tended to some other small bits. When I went to go and get the car, we took it out and Martin wanted my feedback on the map. I actually shocked myself because I suggested we maybe do a few pops and bangs. I didn't want too much, I didn't want it to be antisocial, but for me, it's part of the rally car thing. As it happens, the link set up in here has both launch control and anti-lag capabilities, but I didn't want either of those because I do like using the car, I don't want it broken all the time. However, I do like the idea of the odd little pop and crack on the overrun, you know, when you've earned it. So I asked if we could map that in, and we tried, but we just 
couldn't. In fact, at one point, we were throwing so much fuel at the car, you could smell it, and even still, it refused to pop and bang. We're still working on that issue and hopefully there will be a resolution soon. At this point in time, I'm more annoyed at the fact that we can't get it to do what we want rather than the fact that it won't pop and bang. I have paid for that ECU, damn it. It better do what I tell it. The car also, when I took it away overnight, decided to blow a bulb. And though I impressed myself by actually fixing it, I didn't fix it. It turned out that the issue was an aftermarket connector somebody had spliced in. So the next morning I popped back to MK, they sorted that, did a couple of other small bits too, and the car was good to go. I went to pick up the computer, drove the 240 miles home, and it behaved itself, other than being quite thirsty, more so than I seem to recall. And now it's back. Is it done? No, there are still quite a few things we need to sort. There is a warning light on the dash about a bulb that doesn't work, that does. The clocks themselves are also blue, presumably thanks to an enterprising previous owner who thought it was a good idea. Pretty convinced Toyota didn't set the car up that way. I wouldn't mind it if you could actually see the dashboard at night, but you can't. Half of the lights only work half of the time and they're the half that you need. I also want to get a full alignment done and there's more to be done for the underside too. I want it all fully stripped down, looking nice and shiny. When it comes to 1990s Japanese cars, you can never be too careful about corrosion. However, I have at long last been able to properly enjoy this car and so enjoyable it is. I have fallen for it once again. And that really is the hallmark of a great car, isn't it? No matter what it does, you forgive it because it's just that good. And it's just as well, because I have spent quite a bit on this. And in the Celica's defense, over the last couple of months, it has certainly been putting the effort in. The reason this video has taken so long to make is that for about a month, I lent it to a neighbor when his van broke down and it performed flawlessly. I also took it to a Targa Club event where it was surrounded by genuine rally royalty, real Group B machines. And still, the Celica got more than the odd admiring comment and glance. Seeing this car back on the driveway looking resplendent has brought me real genuine joy. The smile that this car can produce, whether I'm just looking at it or taking it out for a drive, is equal to that of anything else that I own. However, so it would seem are the bills. What has this actually cost me? Well, time to tell you. This is the bit you've been waiting for, isn't it? Buying the car, £8,000. The first round of fixes, charge cooler, pump, tires, service items, all of that sort of stuff, they were 700 quid between them. The tires, I got donated by Yokohama. Thank you, Yokohama, you are stars. Ashley's efforts wound up costing about £2,000, a mix of parts and labour. The Pro Repair paint job, by the time we'd also transported the car there, that was just over £4,000. The first bill from MK was £4,150. The second, £4,200. The third, £1,600. And the fourth, £1,550. The Fujitsu Bow exhaust that's on its way, £800. And some paintwork to sort out the little area at the back that Pro Repair hadn't fixed properly, about 250 50 quid. Total, you ready? £19,250. And I know I've left stuff out. I should not have worked that out. I should not have done that. Oh, oh, that's a, that's a lot. That's a lot. Now, in fairness to the Celica, to get this amount of work done on a Ferrari would have cost quite a bit more. Clutch here, hundreds of pounds. Ferrari, thousands of pounds. And you can say that for a lot of the parts. Were this an old M3, it probably would have been a similar amount, if not more. But still, that's a huge sum of money. That's more than double what I paid for the car. Just as well I love it then, isn't it? It really, genuinely is a truly special car. And like many of you, the amount I'm willing to commit to this is probably far more than any normal person would deem sensible. I think I might have a cry or lie down. No, I've got a better idea. I think I'll go for a drive. And soon, I'll make a video about what that's like. Because trust me, it's good, this car. Really good.
So there we have it. That is the story to date of my 1996 Toyota Celica GT4 and the eye-watering sum that I've spent to finally get my dream car. Three and a half years late and about £20,000 over budget, but it's here. And philosophical so-and-so that I am, I suppose the only sensible thing I can do now is try not to think about that and just enjoy the car. I want to say a huge thank you to MK for being so helpful and supportive, to Ashley as well, to all of my friends that have been involved in transporting this car from one side of the country to the other, and most importantly, to all of you for watching my crazy content and enabling me to pay the bills on stuff like this. Thanks for watching. Please don't stop now. Hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.